We're here, sang out Mr. Skerritt as Mr. Lim wrestled the Cadillac to a halt in the sandy parking lot of Pickwick Island State Seashore. Oscar, who had fallen into a troubled doze, dreams of tentacled trees writhing around in his brain, opened one eye. He saw an eye looking back at him. He opened his other eye. He saw another eye looking back at him. They both belonged to Lordis Mangubat, who was leaning close to him. <clears throat> we can escape from these guys, whispered Lordis very quietly. When we get out of the car, I'll stop Mr. Skerritt's toes and trip Mr. Lim. You can run for the lifeguard. No, whispering in the back seat, said Mr. Skerritt. Actually, said Oscar, I want to see where they're taking us. I can't explain everything right now, but I kind of need to find out what's going on. That could be cool, too, said Lourdes. I'm glad you think so, said Oscar. Do you guys in black show up and take... Do guys in black show up and take you to the beach very often, she asked. Believe it or not, this is the very first time, replied Oscar. Oh, interesting. You know, I've never actually been to the beach, she said thoughtfully. Usually, I spend the whole summer at Elite Select Pro Development Baseball Camp. This should be fun. Well, the next time men in suits come to take me for a ride, said Oscar, I'll make sure I cook to call you. Lourdes giggled. What's so funny? demanded Mr. Skerritt. Huh? Nothing, replied Oscar. A beautiful day at the seashore, roared Mr. Lim, stepping out of the car. Let's get moving, said Mr. Skerritt. Kids, bring the cat, because we would never leave a pet locked in a vehicle on a summer day. Last one there is a rotten tomato, added Mr. Lim, looking, locking the car behind him. And you know what happened to rotten tomatoes. Are you limping? Mr. Lim asked Lourdes after a bit. They had crossed the parking lot and were on the sand now. How come you're limping? My toe hurts, said Lourdes. Oscar glanced at her, embarrassed. Let me have a look at it, said Mr. Lim. That's all right, began Mr. Lourdes. Er, began Lourdes. No, really, let me have a look at it, ordered Mr. Lim. Okay, said Lourdes. She sat down and untied her shoe. Mr. Lim crouched beside her. She slid her foot out, and Mr. Lim had a look. By golly, it's dislocated, he said. That's my fault, said Oscar miserably. I'm really sorry, Lourdes. We'll take care of it in a jiffy, said Mr. Lim. Really? asked Oscar. That This might smart, Lourdes, said Mr. Lim. Oscar got, get out of the way. Mr. Skerritt, grab her. Mr. Skerritt slid his arm under Lourdes's and hoisted her off the sand. Mr. Lim held her toe in his hand and pulled. Oscar could swear he saw it stretch out to twice its length, like it was made of rubber. Then Mr. Lim let it go. With a popping sound, it snapped back into place. Wow, whispered Lourdes as Mr. Skerritt lowered her gently to the ground again. That hurt. I figured, said Mr. Lim. Lefty Lefkowitz passed out when I performed the procedure on him after after the Union Street job. But what was the good in telling you about that beforehand and getting you all worried? Excellent point, muttered Lourdes through clenched teeth. Try walking on it now, said Mr. Lim. Lourdes cautiously put weight on her foot. She raised her eyebrow. She took a step. She took another. She put her shoe on. She ran to the edge of the parking lot and back. She did a cartwheel, with perfect form, of course. Hardly hurts at all, she said. Oscar let out the breath he'd been holding. At least these guys were good at something. I got pretty skilled at first, aid back in the day, said Mr. Lim proudly. Came in handy, really, added Mr. Skerritt. What with all the broken bones we encountered. Before Oscar and Lourdes could think about what that meant, Mr. Lim set off toward the crowds of beachgoers on the far side of the dune and called, Come on, let's get cracking! Oscar felt a feeling that, like a lot of things he'd witnessed lart lately, Two men in black suits and black hats with their pants rolled up to their knees and their fish-white feet bare amid the splashers, swimmers, frisbee tossers, and surfers of Pickwick Island seashore was a sight never before seen by human eyes. 
You rarely run across guys dressed like morticians at the beach. And even when you do, they're never passing an orange cat back and forth with a couple of kids and constantly saying, bless you, bless you, to one another who is sneezing, to one of them who is sneezing. But if Mr. Lim and Mr. Scarrett struck out, they hardly seemed to notice the stares. And they sure didn't care. They just trudged through the sand, wearing their black felt hats, sweating like coal miners, plowing furrows in the beach among the blankets with their big feet. But two giant men in black weren't the only questionable spectacle on the beach. Oscar noted uncomfortably that things felt slightly off. The laughter of kids and moms and dads darting in and out of the surf again, or surf ran against the blue sky like the echoes of an alarm bell. The screams of excitement uttered by waves, wave riders fluttered on the edge of hysteria. Arctic terns shrieked as they dove at sandwiches held by toddlers. Unruly clouds seethed overhead as waves churned against one another. And all the while, high-pitched wails echoed against the sky. Oscar wondered what was going on. Maybe the last inscription he'd seen on the watch had been right. Maybe this was out of joint, and maybe these people were starting to feel it. Slowly, the noise and activity began to die down. A strange hush settled over the beach. The waves calmed until the surface of the ocean lay as smooth as glass. Beachgoers stopped what they were doing and turned to look, and then, slowly at first, and then faster and faster, the sea drew away from the shore several feet, and then several more, and then more, and more, and more, until it seemed as if the salt water would recede all the way to Portugal, leaving the ocean floor bare to the horizon. Clear the beach, cried the lifeguards, blowing their whistles frantically, but there was no time because now the water had stopped retreating and it was rolling towards the dune in one giant wave. It moved faster and toward high and towered higher as it came. The line of surfers who'd been left stranded started to run. Kids with boogie boards scrambled towards higher ground. The mothers and fathers of the toddlers and floaties grabbed their babies and tried to flee, but it was happening too fast. Oscar, Lourdes, Mr. Skerritt, hold on to me, cried Mr. Lim. They did, luckily. Mr. Lim was quite large, and there was plenty to grab. Sleeves, lapel, long black tie. Just as they all clambered onto Mr. Lim, the rogue wave crashed across the beach. When it hit, it was six feet high, but it spread out as it rolled in. So soon it was five feet, so soon it was five feet high, and then four, and then three, and then knee-deep, carrying with its folding chairs and umbrellas and ice chests and paper books, paperback books, and decks of cards and sunglasses and hats and paddle ball paddles and skim boards and sunscreen and Mountain Dew bottles and tumbling over the sand here and there, people. It rolled everything up into a giant froth and washed its load over the dune and across the boardwalk through the changing house and dumped it into the parking lot. The beach lay deserted in its wake, and Mr. Lim towered like an oak in the middle of it all, unmoved with Lourdes, Oscar, Mr. Scarrett, and Dr. Soul clinging to his suit. The water slid back to the ocean placidly. Oscar let go of Mr. Lim and breathed a sigh of relief, because even though a few babies howled, nobody seemed seriously hurt. But he wondered, has this had this wave happened because time was out of joint? And was time out of joint because he'd stopped the watch? Could this mayhem be his fault too? Whew, close one. We'd better get this young man to the boss, said Mr. Lim, wringing the water out of his pants cuffs. Pronto. Things are changing faster than we thought. They set off north along the shore. Where are we going? asked Lourdes 20 minutes later as they struggled through the endless sand. When will we get there? Look, I think that's where we're headed, said Oscar, pointing at a speck in the distance. Mr. Lim, Mr. Scarrett, and Lourdes squinted. I don't see anything, said Lourdes. 
The man standing by himself on the beach, staring at the waves, said Oscar, near the abandoned submarine watchtower. Silently, the other scanned the sand. Finally, Lorda said, I see him, a speck on the shore. Gee, willikers, said Mr. Skerritt. Your friend has good eyes. When they're open, tossed in Lourdes. If you're talking about his batting technique, said Mr. Lim, I have to agree. As they approached the man, Oscar could see he was thin and tanned. From behind a cascade of long blonde bangs, his eyes pondered the waves. He studied each one intently and, I'm sorry, as it broke over the sand. He watched them all crash and swirl together and combine into small rivers that flowed back to the sea and then pull apart and reform and break again over and over and over. From time to time, the man smiled a little at what he saw. He seemed to be observing something spectacular in the never-repeating patterns of ocean waves. Oscar and Lourdes, allow me to introduce Dr. T. Buffington Smiley, said Mr. Lim. Professor Emeritus at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, California Institute of Technology, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and Gloucester County Institute of Technology, added Mr. Skerritt. Our boss, concluded Mr. Lim. Pleased to meet you, said T. Buffington, smiling, pulling his blue eyes away from the water to gaze kindly at Oscar and Lourdes. Why are we here? Lourdes demanded. T. Buffington Smiley blinked at the bluntness of her question. Mr. Lim, did I ask you to bring this delightful young woman? He asked. It sounded like he was being a jerk. It sounded like he really wanted to know. It sounded like he honestly couldn't remember if he'd requested Lourdes' presence. She kind of invited herself, said Mr. Lim. Under circumstances beyond her control, added Mr. Skerritt. T. Buffington Smiley turned his face back toward the ocean. He never lost his smile. How about if we take a moment to contemplate the waves, he said. Maybe, said Lourdes, pointing with a quivering hand to a 200-year-old warship under full sail, carrying men, carrying men wearing red coats who peered glumly over the rail as they cruised by. We should contemplate that antique boat full of British soldiers. Oscar gazed at the ship in fascination and in dread. It seemed to have sailed in straight from the Revolutionary War. Time must be way, way out of joint, he realized. Mr. Lim and Mr. Skerritt observed the ship, ex exchanged a rueful glance. <clears throat> right, said T. Buffington, smiling solemnly as the ship sailed out of sight. You're exactly right. Things are getting weird, and they're going to get weirder. What do you mean? Do you know the, why these things are happening? Asked Oscar. Fear crept into his voice, though he tried to keep it out. I do, said T. Buffington, smiling. I am a cosmologist, which means I study the workings of the universe. When I first started, I performed my computations with a pencil and paper, and then I graduated to what is known as a slide roll. Next, to find answers, I punched calculator buttons. And for a while there, when I worked at NASA, I enjoyed using one of the most powerful computers known to man. What happened to all your stuff? asked Oscar. Left it in the office when I moved to the beach, said T. Buffington, smiley. Now I consult the waves, and I draw my conclusions from the unpredictable but meaningful interactions of their swirls. Is that a new technique? asked Lourdes dubiously. Yes, replied T. Buffington, smiley. I am the first and only scientist in the world to use it. So far, but it could catch on. A breaker crashed near their feet. It shot up the sand further than one before. A new sun, said T. Buffington, smiley, finally, is lifting the tides more every day. What new sun? asked Lourdes. A rogue star out there, said Professor Smiley, waving at the heavens, caught in the gravitational field of our solar system. I can see its influence in the patterns of waves. I calculate that it came within 19 seconds of passing us safely by, but last night, there was a glitch in time, and 19 seconds went missing at exactly the wrong moment. 
Now the star is caught in our solar system's pool and approaching us. Soon astronomers will detect it, and after that, it will become a second sun in our sky. How do you know about the rogue star if astronomers haven't detected it? Asked Oscar, his unease growing, especially at the mention of the 19-second glitch, which was pretty sure, which he was pretty sure he was responsible for, since who else had caused a 19-second hiccup in time except for him? I have observed the stars pull on the sea, said T. Buffington Smiley, gesturing at the endless waves. I have traced the movements of the waves and the tides all the way into, into space to confirm the rogue star's existence. So what do we do? asked Oscar. T. Buffington Smiley raised one finger and observed the sea as it ebbed away again. I personally will do what I always do, which is watch for the wave that tells me the answer. Before them, the ocean heaved forward and a towering swell sped toward the sand, lifting the gray surface of the water like the back of an enormous beast until it reared, tipped, and broke with a roar, darting in a foamy sheet up the beach to inundate their feet. That one was almost as big as the one that wiped out all the picnic blankets, observed Mr. Skerritt. <clears throat> as the wave receded with flecks of quartz and pearlescent shells flashing in its wake, the next roller tripped over it, thudding onto the sand, causing the whole beach to reverberate like a hollow floor pounded by a thousand boot heels. It slid back down shore only to be devoured by the next wave. And something about this enormous breaker snapped T. Buffington Smiley out of his reverie. He turned to Mr. Lim and Mr. Skerritt. Maybe you two can take this cat for a walk. Lordus, too. I'm allergic to cats, said Lordus, sneezing at the mere mention of a stroll with Dr. Soul. No, said T. Buffington Smiley, regarding her thoughtfully. You're not. Cats just make you nervous. Take a deep breath. Relax. Visualize Dr. Soul's silky orange fur and his mesmerizing green eyes. Ponder the mystery that is the cat. Lord has cocked an eyebrow as if to say, I know this won't make me stop sneezing, but she didn't protest. Dr. Soul picked his way across the damp sand and rubbed himself against her ankles. How do you feel? asked T. Buffington Smiley. About the same... So far, replied Lourdes doubtfully, but she followed Dr. Soul, Mr. Lim, and Mr. Scared along the beach anyway. Now, said T. Buffington Smiley, turning his attention to Oscar when the others were out of earshot, we need to talk about the watch. I, I, I know, said Oscar. Many vow powerful people want the watch back where it belongs, said T. Buffington Smiley. They have enlisted me and my friends, Mr. Lim and Mr. Scared, to help. I do most of the thinking. Mr. Lim and Mr. Skerritt knock on doors and track down leads. Who wants the watch back? Professor Smiley asked Oscar. The FBI, the CIA, the Pentagon, NASA, the Smithsonian Institution, the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, and the Vitor Klam Thimble and Handel Timepiece Museum of Mount Etna, said T. Buffington Smiley, for starters. Wow. Those places are all pretty good at finding things. Why did they need your help? Asked Oscar. Because I'm even better at locating lost items than they are, said T. Buffington Smiley, partly because I have colleagues like Mr. Lim and Mr. Skerritt who are skilled at searching door to door, partly because I know the right questions to ask. And now I have to ask you one of those questions, and I hope you will answer honestly. Do you have the watch hidden where Mr. Lim and Mr. Skerritt can't find it? No, said Oscar. Did you have the watch? asked T. Buffington Smiley. Yes, said Oscar. Just admitting this made him feel a million times better. Would you mind telling me how you got it? asked T. Buffington Smiley. My neighbor gave it to me, said Oscar. Miss Ellington. Does she by any chance ride a giant tricycle? asked T. Buffington Smiley, because Mr. Lim and Mr. Skerritt have been searching Mount Etna for the rider of a giant tricycle 
who was caught on security camera footage around the time the watch disappeared with from its tamper-proof, fireproof, bomb-proof vault in the basement of Veter Clam Thimble and Handheld Timepiece Museum, which for years has been its rightful home. <clears throat> she does have a trike like that, said Oscar, but Miss Ellington would never steal anything. I don't know how the watch got on her kitchen f- table. She said I could have it as a token of appreciation for helping water her tomatoes, which was weird because she never gives me a token of appreciation for helping water her tomatoes, except for maybe some hot chocolate. <clears throat> when he finished, Oscar felt like he could breathe for the first time since he fabricated his Homer. He hadn't realized how badly he needed to tell somebody about everything that happened. Men were knocking on her door. Mr. Lim and Mr. Scared even thought, even though I didn't know who they were at the time. I guess Miss Ellington wanted to get the watch out of the back of the house before they came in the front. <clears throat> but after she gave it to me, I think I made a mistake. Which was? asked T. Buffington smiley. I used it to stop time so I could hit a home run, said Oscar, staring at his feet in the sand. I see. And how long did you keep time stopped? asked T. Buffington smiley. Eighteen seconds, said Oscar. Nineteen if you had the second one. My mom was yelling at me about my socks. Anything else you want to get off your chest? asked T. Buffington, smiling. Yes, said Oscar. After I used the watch, I put it in the bread box for safekeeping, but it disappeared. Wow, said T. Buffington, smiling. A rapidly escalating catastrophe. What's going on, Professor Smiley? Oscar blurted. Is there more to the story? I did something terrible, didn't I? That's why there was a minute, miniature tsunami at Pickwick Island Seashore. That's why the trees have tentacles. That's why there are pterodactyls in the sky. Yes, T. Buffington smiley said slowly. But don't panic. We may be able to fix this, he paused, although it won't be easy. All I wanted was for the Wildcats to win. It was my fault they were going to lose because I got Lourdes injured. Everyone was counting on me, moaned Oscar. That's why I used the watch. Oh, I can't believe I did this. Wait, what did I do exactly? You broke the universe, said T. Buffington, smiley. There's no other way to put it. How could I have done something so terrible? Wailed Oscar. Here's how, replied T. Buffington, smiley. Our universe is part of an infinite, infinite collection of universes. Some people think of it as the multiverse. I think of it as the mind-bendingly large tomato plant. This tomato plant is always growing, expanding, budding, and branching, sprouting new shoots every nanosecond. And each one of those branches is a universe, and one of those universes is ours. Our universe is a branch of a tomato plant, clarified Oscar, a mind-bendingly large, theoretical one, yes, said T. Buffington, smiley, always growing as time flows by. I like to imagine that it's planted in the garden of a little old lady who takes very good care of it. I know a little old lady like that, blurted out Oscar, a real one, I mean, with real tomato plants. Sorry, I interrupted. Can you tell me more about what I did? Time is like rain falling on the leaves of the plant, continued T. Buffington, smiley. When time flows, the cosmic plant thrives. What if time doesn't flow, asked Oscar. You mean, for instance, asked T. Buffington Smiley, what if a certain person who I won't name were to halt the fundamental processes of our branch two? I don't know. Score a run in a baseball game? Sure, said Oscar. Let's go with that example. <clears throat> Just like the branch of a real tomato plant when there is no water, said T. Buffington Smiley, the branch of the cosmic tomato plant shrivels. It droops. It gets a kink in it. I only stopped time for 19 seconds, said Oscar. How much could that hurt? Possibly a lot, said T. Buffington, smiley. Those 19 seconds you took are bouncing around the universe right now like a hand clap in an empty stadium. They're bounding and rebounding and rebounding all along the lengths of our branch, growing more monotonous, momentous all the time. You took 19 seconds from yesterday. 
So yesterday took 19 seconds from today, and today took 19 from a day long ago, and that day took 19 seconds from another day, and so it goes on and on all along the branch. Redcoats off the shore of Delaware, said Oscar, trees with tentacles, Boston Braves among the ghost runners, and flocks of tiny pterodactyls. Those glitches in time make snarls in the universe, T. Buffington Smiley continued. What kind of snarls? asked Oscar. Snarls in which good people fail, bad people succeed, in which your friends and loved ones will experience disappointment and defeat. Your adversaries will enjoy triumph, in which everything falls apart. After a while, if the branch gets gnarled enough, the cosmic little old lady in charge of tending the tomato plant will snap it right off and throw it away. This is terrible, whispered Oscar. What you're saying is awful, even even though you did an awesome job explaining it. Thank you, little brother. Thank you. The clarity of my explanations has contributed greatly to my success in the scientific community. But I have to tell you, the situation is bad. It's getting worse. You have to act fast. If you have to fix, you have to fix the disruption you caused. What do I do? asked Oscar. Three things, said T. Buffington Smiley, gazing at the waves as if reading them. One, find the watch before somebody uses it again. We've already lost 19 seconds. We can't afford to lose any more. Two, put back the 19 seconds you already took. And three, beat the Yankees fair and square to make up for the victory you stole. If you don't accomplish all three tasks, our universe is done for. Wow, that's a lot to accomplish. Could you by any chance help me? Asked Oscar, panicked by the overwhelming tasks. Unfortunately, I can't, said T. Buffington Smiley. I must remain here by the seaside. Someone needs to keep an eye on the condition of the universe, and that someone is me. I am best suited to doing here to doing so here on the beach, where I can watch the ocean waves. A fitful breeze began to blow across the sand again. Suddenly, Dr. Soul came tearing out of the dunes. On his tail followed a saber-toothed cat, 20 yards behind but gaining. Every second, the big cat got closer to the little house cat. Dr. Soul, cried Oscar, running toward his pet. But just as the saber-toothed cat prepared to leap, it disappeared in a vortex of wind-blown sand. Dr. Soul stopped to lick his paws and to shoot Oscar a resentful look. Lucky, that enormous beast moment with us ran out of time, just in time, observed T. Buffington Smiley. He had to go back where he came from. Oscar knew without counting that 19 seconds had passed. A perfect example of his time pulling 19 seconds from another time to make up for lost time. It was just too bad that the 19 seconds his time chose chose happened to have an ancient predator in them. Just then, Lourdes came running up with Mr. Lim and Mr. Scarrett close behind. She scooped Dr. Soul into her arms. You're safe. Oh, thank goodness. She buried her face in his fur, which appeared to annoy him a little, but didn't bother her at all. Professor Smiley was right, she said. I'm not allergic. It was just my fear of cats. I'm over it now. There are much scarier felines in the world. Did you see the saber-toothed tiger? Dr. Soul's a stuffed animal compared to him. I think Dr. Soul is wonderful, and I'm so glad he's safe. Ah, said Mr. Skerritt, patting Dr. Soul affectionately. If the coast is clear, we better hit the road, said Mr. Lim, scanning the beach for an additional prehistoric predators. Or people back in Mount Etna are going to start wondering where these kids are. Remember your three tasks, Oscar, said T. Buffington Smiley. I'll remember, responded Oscar. How could I forget? Silence filled the Cadillac as they drove home. Mr. Lim and Mr. Skerritt seemed to be occupied by thoughts of their own, and Dr. Soul embarked on what would turn out to be a two-hour nap, which was actually kind of short by his standards. Lourdes and Oscar sat quietly in the back seat. I had an interesting time today, said Lourdes, breaking the silence. I'm glad you didn't get mad when I sneaked into your trunk. 
No problem, said Mr. Lim, glancing at her in the rearview mirror. But I have one thing to ask, Lourdes continued. What is it? asked Mr. Skerritt. Can somebody please explain everything that just happened? Sure, said Mr. Lim. Absolutely, said Mr. Skerritt. Oscar, go right ahead, said Mr. Lim. Don't mind us, not one bit, said Mr. Skerritt. Okay, well, first of all, began Oscar, and then he stopped, much like the coffee suspended in the air above his mom's mug. He dangled, neither here nor there, neither up nor down. <clears throat> first of all, what? Prompted Lourdes. Oscar? He needed to tell her something, obviously, but unfortunately, the truth was not an option. For one thing, it involved his cheating at baseball, which he really didn't want to reveal to Loris Mangibat, the best baseball player he'd ever known. The truth also involved Oscar's breaking the universe, which was just terrible. Maybe he could get away with only part of the truth. Which part, though? He imagined different lines he might deliver. I fudged. No. The multiverse is a cosmic tomato plant, and I broke the limb we live on. Didn't exactly have the right ring. I have to accomplish three impossible tasks. Sounded like the beginning of a movie with elves in it. Oscar looked up, flustered. Lourdes was staring at him. There's a watch, he burst out finally. It's missing. Professor Smiley lost his watch, asked Lourdes. Yes, said Oscar slowly, feeling Mr. Limbs and Mr. Skerritt's eyes on him. He... He knew they knew this wasn't the whole truth, but Oscar blundered on. Professor Smiley lost his watch. Does he need your help to find it or something? Pressed Lourdes. Oscar hesitated. If he explained any more, he would reveal too much. Yes, answered Oscar simply. I could help you find it, said Lourdes. Uncle Noni left his metal detector in Mom's garage. He won't mind if we use it. He won't be back from Manila for three years, at least. The only thing is, if Professor Smiley lost his watch, why are we going back to Mount Etna? That doesn't make sense. Shouldn't we be looking around Pickwick Island? When Oscar didn't respond, she asked, Is there something you're not telling me? Actually, said Oscar, it's a little complicated. I think it will take more than just a metal detector to find the watch. Professor Smiley isn't exactly sure where to start looking. He asked me to help him think it over. I'm good at thinking, Lourdes declared. She stared straight ahead, but Oscar could see her watch, her watching him out of the corner of her eye, waiting for him to ask her to help find the watch. Want to come to my house tonight after the game and think it over together? <clears throat> We can have a bonfire in the backyard with s'mores. S'mores always help me think, tossed in Mr. Skerritt. But after the observation, silence fell. So, do you want to come make s'mores and try fig to figure out where Professor Smiley's watch is, Lord is pressed? If only the problem were as simple as finding a lost watch, Oscar thought, then sure, he'd have said yes. But he lied, cheated broken the universe. There was, that was not so simple, and it was not a problem he wanted to or even could share with Lourdes. Thanks, he replied, but I can't. Oh, okay, said Lourdes, sounding stung. Fine. It's just that it's my mission. T. Buffington Smiley gave it to me for a reason, said Oscar. He noticed Mr. Lim watching him in the rearview mirror, but as soon as he met Mr. Lim's eyes, Mr. Lim looked away. Really? It's okay. I don't care, replied Lourdes tardily. She gave the look she gave Oscar before turning to stare silently out the window for the remainder of the trip made him feel like he'd just dropped a fly ball in the bottom of the ninth. And that fly ball was Lourdes Mengebat's feelings. And of all the fly balls he dropped so far in his life, this was the one Oscar regretted the most.